Hi, everyone. <laughs> I look like H-E double ho hockey sticks because I just, I have no makeup on, but I did wash my hair, so alert the media. How are you guys? I'm super excited. I'm always super excited. I'm going to have to come up with a different expression. Um, I'm really uh, anticipating my conversation with Glennon Doyle because I've never met her and I've been reading so much about her. And we're both fellow Virginians. And I'm, I'm, uh, hi, Glennon. Katie, hi. I can't believe I have never met you, Glennon Doyle. I can't either. And I feel like we have, but I just discussed it with Abby and we definitely have not. I know. And I am, uh, first of all, everybody, I am just, first of all, can I just say a couple things? Congratulations on all your success. I think that you are really, uh, you're resonating so deeply and profoundly with so many people and uh, you're kind of a, a human whisperer. I think it's just so exciting and I'm just so happy for you, but also happy for the people who are, who are getting so much from your work. Well, I'm happy for myself because I <laughs> just decided I'm going to make a t-shirt that says Katie Couric says I'm the human whisperer. So well, you kind of are. I good about you, my chances so, right now. Glennon, I have so much to talk to you about, and I know so many people also sent in questions. I want to be super responsive to the people who are joining us on Instagram, but let's just, let's just chew the fat for a minute. How are you doing? How are you handling this most bizarre time? Katie, I feel I have good days. Uh, today is not my best day. Katie. No, I was, no, because I, you know, I, I just feel like I've been really zen and handling my people pretty well. Um, but today, I just we call it getting chippy in my house. It's like chippy, the, chippy. It's like I, I think it was originally a soccer term. Uh huh. When, when the two teams started getting mad at each other, so Abby taught me that that's called getting chippy. So now in our house. When people start to get a little, we call it quarantine. mean, like when people start to get meaner than usual. Right. So I just got really quarantine mean today, Katie. And I did picked you? a fight. I picked a fight. Oh. Just did. What my, do you think, what do you think brought that on? Do you think it was just sort of the monotony of, of our existence right now? Mm-hmm. I do. But, but actually, I'm always like this. <laughs> so. Are you always getting chippy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I get a little, you know, I mean, we're just stuck with ourselves right now and we're stuck with each other and just every once in a while you know, in my head I'm saying this will pass don't speak it don't speak your annoyance this will pass this is you and then as I'm telling myself this is your loving person you love her this moment will pass my mouth Ooh. is telling her how I feel about the things so so, so you're having a hard time stifling yourself like Edith Bunker. By the way, this is my ginger ale, everyone. This is my kombucha. It's the closest okay. I can get to closest <laughs> exactly. I can get to a buzz these days. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, and your kids are doing okay. How are they yeah. handling all this? They're older, so thank God. I, I don't know how anyone with small children. Me every either. day, I think about it. Every day, they should all get medals at the end of this. I don't know how they're doing it. I have a 17 year old, a 14 year old, and a, and a, a 12 year old. <laughs> I'm fairly certain that's how old they are. <laughs> and they are doing okay. I mean, they're sad. We have a very confusing situation in our town, which I think a lot of people are going through, which is we live in two separate worlds because we're all watching two different news stations. Oh, right. So m many of my children's friends are out and about, hanging out with each other, um, carrying on as if nothing's happening. And we haven't left the house for 50 days. Yeah. So, so that's are they, are, are they Are they mad about that? Or are they uh, accepting of it? They are mostly accepting of it. They understand the concept of two different newses. I tried, this is, this is the, Katie, this is the, the best way I could explain it to them, that it actually worked. A couple nights ago at dinner, they were complaining about 
not seeing their friends. And I said, you know what? You know those horror movies that you watch where there's always a few stupid people who go to check out the noise or to go out before things are ready? You want to be that stupid person? Because that stupid person gets dead. And Every they time we watch that. That, they were like, oh, yeah, I don't want to be the stupid person. I know that one. The one who you say, don't go, don't go. So that bought me a few more days, I think. Well, so you guys are in Florida, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there are two different kind of realities going on in states like Florida and Georgia. But that's kind of true of the whole country right now. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's disconcerting. How do you kind of keep your equilibrium, Lennon, with, with so much um, division? It's nothing new, but I feel like while we're seeing great glimpses of humanity, we're also seeing the country still kind of being torn apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, here's, I mean, the good thing about crisis is that it clarifies. It, it makes things really simple. I was much more worried about division, the country being divided, like before the global pandemic. <laughs> right? So it's very clarifying for me right now. All I know is we sat down, Craig, Abby, we have co-parents, three of us, Right. God bless everyone who's trying to do this with two or one parent. I don't know. Bless you. Um, and we just said, we're going to listen to the scientists. We're just going to listen to science. So we believe in science. And so we do um, our homework with the science and the numbers. And um, we talk a lot with our kids about, you know, Luckily, we've been talking to our kids for a long time about how everyone else can be doing something and it can still not be the right thing, right? Right. So they get that concept. Um, and, you know, also, also, Katie, like our kids, I've been thinking about this a lot. My parenting gen, our parenting generation was right. We got this memo that our kids are never supposed to suffer. Like that right. nothing's ever supposed to be hard for them, Right. And like, we're supposed to fix all of their problems and they're supposed to be happy all the time. And that's our job, right? And that's also why our kids suck a little bit, right? I agree, no, I agree. It's yeah, all the helicopter parenting and the, everybody gets a prize and all that. Yes, the, the participation trophies ended quickly after Abby entered our family. Yes, Katie. did they? She will grab those things out of people's hands. Yes, yes, because like, and now I will teach you what she has taught me about the soccer, which is that winning teaches you something and losing teaches you something, but participation trophies teach you nothing, okay? But one cool thing about this time is that we can't fix it. I can't fix it for my kids. It is what it is. It sucks. They have lost things. They are sad. They are having a difficult time. And... Luckily, I've been able to teach them, yeah, like sometimes we do hard things for the greater good, and that makes us not suck as human yeah. beings, right? So I think it might shape them a little bit in good ways. I think that you're right, that, that it's been quite a long time since everyone has appreciated the, the meaning of true sacrifice and the meaning of delaying your own personal gratification for the, for the greater good. So I think this will, I, I, I hope this will be a transformational experience for their generation in a very positive way, almost like a, a, the greatest generation 2.0, you know, who knows, right? Yeah. But um, well, I want to talk to you about, about you a little bit, Glennon, because um, first of all, Amanda, just sent me this. I'm so excited to read it. I'm way behind the curve. I, I think everybody and their brother <laughs> has already read your book, loves it so much. It's a New York Times bestseller. This is your third book, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so you were on a roll, but a couple quick things. I didn't know you were from Virginia. You're from Burke, Virginia. You went to James Madison University. I'm from Virginia as well. I know. Uh, you know, and you're, is, you're at UVA, right? I went to UVA. I did. Yeah. And, and yes, so yes. did Amanda, who works mm -hmm. with you. And yeah. um, so, so you, you had a very, very tough childhood, which I think is hard to believe when you 
see this, you know, glowing, seemingly very happy person, but you, you suffered from bulimia, which actually I also suffered from when I was in high school and college. And um, you were very uncomfortable in your own skin for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, I became bulimic when I was 10. I can't believe that. I know. I know. I look at my kids right now, and I just, I, my youngest is 11, 12, and I just can't believe how it's just too young to have a secret life, to be split like that, you know? Um, but I did, yeah. And I never got my bulimia addressed. We never got to the root of it for decades. So I, that just morphed into alcoholism and other things, drugs, all the things. And I didn't get sober till I was 25 when I found out that I was pregnant with Chase, who is now 17. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's so interesting because it's, there's, it's always been both Katie. Like I had a very tough childhood because I was sick right? Because I was right. a super sensitive kid, a super sensitive kid who just didn't have the skills um, or the resources back then to learn how to handle that sensitivity, which I now have because I really am the exact same person that I was when I was 10. I just channel that sensitivity and it makes me a good artist, right? And I think I channel my anxiety, which I call my fire, but my therapist calls anxiety. Um, I think that's what makes me a good activist, so I don't know, I think we're all just trying to figure out how in the next part of our lives to kind of use what we always thought were our weaknesses, right? Like most of the things that I thought were my weaknesses have turned out to be like these superpower things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also like I, um, I also had a beautiful childhood. I mean, it's, it's, it's not as simple as I also had two parents who were madly and deeply in love with me. My, I always try to tell all those parents who have little ones with, you know, addiction or mental illness issues like I did. My mom was a high school guidance counselor. Okay. Like she had, she knew all the things. They tried all the things. They did all the things. My dad was a, uh, um, uh, a high school and, and middle school principal. They were in education. Like they knew mm -hmm. kids. Um, but I just had to go through what I was going to go through. And, and you, know. you know, and, and you started writing, I know a, a Christian blog, which is so <laughs> interesting. And I think I read somewhere, Glennon, that you had to start writing for real because you'd send, you'd send pieces of your writing to all your friends and they just got so sick of it that you had to kind of channel this and start writing it for a bigger audience. And um, that's a literal thing that happened. My yeah. friends sent me, my friend Joanna, who is still my dear friend and actually designed the cover of Love Warrior. She got so sick of reading every day, Katie, every day I would send pages of just my feelings and thoughts about the world. And, and then when they didn't write back because they were, at work, I would ping them. So did you get a chance? Like, did you, did you have any thoughts about my thoughts? And Joanna sent me a link to how to make a blog. And she said, honey, this is what people do who have as many thoughts as you do. <laughs> and so you started doing, you started doing your blog yeah. and you started getting an audience and tell me about how, how the Christian aspect of it and, and how it was called Monastery, is that right? Yeah, so I was obsessed, still obsessed with um, all monastic traditions. Back then I was completely obsessed with the Benedictines. Like I just, all the, I just always felt like there was a better way to live than this like Lord of the Flies way we exist out into the world, right? right. Love the idea of these people that like, just kind of leave this, this world to create these intentional communities that run by a gentler, slower, kinder set of rules. So that's why I named it Monastery. So I wrote about um, family. I wrote some about faith. I wrote about the world. The reason why nobody ever called me a Christian mommy blogger until I announced my relationship with Abby. Oh. And then, never. 
Uh-huh. And then, because I was just a woman who, I just, if you're, if you're someone who has a uterus and you write on the interwebs, they just call you a mommy blogger, right? That's just like a dismissive way of Kind of like labeling. perky, Glennon. Yes. Oh, and feisty. You're so feisty, Katie. You're not brilliant <laughs> and like wicked smart. You're just perky. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> so, Word. What? <laughs> Yes, word is right. So, so I think that Christian mommy blogger was the sexiest, um, like, uh, clickbait that you could put with Abby Wambach because she was uh, a lesbian, soccer, what, whatever, Olympian, and so mom blogger and Christian would be the most dramatic things. So somebody wrote that in a headline, and Katie, it will be on my freaking tombstone. Christian mommy blogger. Christian mommy blogger rests here. It doesn't I think matter what else I do. Mine, mine is going to be perky no more. <laughs> Yours is better. I want us to be buried next to each other. And then this for generations will come and pick it. But you were, I know, Glennon, you were concerned. Uh, so many of your followers are Christian. And mm -hmm. you were concerned with your relationship with Abby what the impact would be, and you were pleasantly surprised, I know. That was so beautiful. I was so, I was a little bit scared. I wasn't as scared as some other people who are on my team were. Um, when I announced this, Katie, it was right when my book, Love Warrior, was releasing, mm -hmm. which was, um, <laughs> it was already picked as an Oprah book club pick. And it was, the tagline of it was an epic marriage redemption story. Okay. So it was complicated. Yeah, I was going to say, not great timing, Glenn. No, I'm sweating now. Like just, <laughs> um, so to say there was concern around this announcement would be an understatement. Okay. But this is, but the very lucky isn't the right word, but the thing is that I had been speaking out just rabidly about LGBTQ full inclusion and fierce acceptance for a decade, right? Before I came out to my audience. So it was one of those beautiful things where like, if you're telling your truth, you've already eliminated the right people, right? The people right. who are there are there and have, already know your heart and so this um announcement to anybody who really knew me and followed me was not a departure in any way from the the um ethos of our community it was it was a manifestation of it right so the, it taught me so much about how you speak up you speak up before it's you <laughs> Right. Right. right, right, because eventually it's going to be you. It's going to be your family. It's going to be your friend. And if you haven't spoken up before, then it will feel like. I'm well, sure. uh, it might feel like a betrayal when it really isn't. Yes. It's consistent. It's consistent with your values. Yes. And uh, and 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 I think it's so cool, Glennon, how the three of you are parenting together. Mm -hmm. Your ex-husband, which sounds like, uh, which is the topic of, of Love Warrior, as you mentioned. And, but, but how were you able to come to this extraordinary, um, you know, understanding among you when there could have been a lot of bitterness and anger and resentment, uh, certainly on the part of your ex-husband, I imagine, mm -hmm. yes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, here's what I think. I think so. our family does work really beautifully this way, much more beautifully than it did when we were married. Uh -huh. okay? I, I say all the time, like, I fully believe whenever anyone refers to us as a broken family, it cracks me up because I'm like, oh, no, no, no. We are fixed. We are fixed. This is, this is the opposite of broken for us, right? Um, but because it works so well, sometimes I actually feel bad showing it to the world because it's unusual. And here's one of the reasons why I think it's worked so well is because I think that there is such a thin line between deep, passionate love and like 
ragey hate, right? <laughs> yeah. They're like almost the same. It's just like passion and it's just like turned this way or that way. But Craig and I didn't have that, right? We got married because, I mean, both of us would say this openly, like we got married because it was the right thing to do because I was pregnant, because we were panicked and young and like, and we were awesome co-parents and we always struggled with intimacy, right? With emotional intimacy, with physical intimacy, all of it. So, so when we switched over to, to our divorce, the, it, what, we didn't have that passion thing that turns one way or the other, right? We just, we were always good co-parents, right? And we had, we had worked um, out so many things in our previous marriage that had to do with a lot that went down in our, we had to forgive each other years before this sort of thing happened. Right. So any kind of like uh, passion that that brings up, we had already been through it for years. Like we, I thought that we were doing the work um, for years so that we could have our happily ever after, but I actually think we were doing all of that work um, so that we could part without any hatred, right? With just kind of this respect. And he's just, in, he has, he caught daily. I mean, still, it's a daily thing. It's not just something that happened and it's over. It's a daily thing because co-parenting in a side of a divorce is never easy. Mm -hmm. And you still just always rub each other. I mean, I always say, people say, how did you forgive Craig? I'm like, I... Because for me, forgiveness is like 80% friendship and 20% I still want to stab you. Like we still have those <laughs> moments all the time, right? Um, but he has consistently put the kids above any other thing that we have going on. And so does Abby. This is, I think, a secret of it. Whenever I get pissy or mm, just less than my best self about Craig, Abby always reels me in and defends him. And honestly, it's a little bit annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it does sound like he probably grew from this whole uh, experience as well, right? And does he have someone in, I, I, I don't, does he, he, he has someone so in happy. his life? Which he, is he, great. He has a lovely girlfriend who wants to make out with him. Like, this is, <laughs> working out well for everybody. There's no such thing as one-way liberation, right? Like, I fully believe that. When one person in a relationship is slowly dying, the other person is rarely having the time of their lives, right? It's just right. like sometimes somebody has to be brave enough or whatever enough to say, actually, this isn't working. And the other person eventually goes, you were right, which is we have that conversation all the time, like we needed to free each other. Well, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that it sounds like it worked well for everybody, that you're super happy, <laughs> that he's happy. And I know that I, I want to ask you a, a little bit quickly, and then I want to get to some questions because God, everyone wants to talk to you, Glennon. And I'm just actually, I'm just the vessel. I'm just the vessel for everyone listening to you. But um, was it hard to write your book? Cause I'm in the throes of doing it. And I'm actually a little afraid to read your book because I've tried to stay away from memoirs because I don't want to be full of self-doubt and self, self-loathing that I can't write as well as a lot of people. So, so how did you have the courage to write uh, at what you talked about in your TED Talk, uh, you know, share what was in your heart and be honest and kind of be able to really um, communicate it in a way that would be interesting to people? I guess, I think there's like a million different ways to write memoir. And I love so many different styles of memoir. I can only tell you my way. By the way, I'm drinking <laughs> diet ginger ale because people keep asking what I'm drinking. It's diet ginger ale, everybody, <laughs> don't worry. wasted, you guys. Yeah, yeah. woo! So perky and wasted. Um... I always feel like, so often what I do is my whole dining room becomes this like beautiful mind, scary situation where I put up like a bunch of different moments from my life. You know how those moments that are just like, oh, that 
stood for everything in that time. Like whether sometimes, sometimes a big thing like a birth or a death or a, a ceremony or something, but sometimes the little thing that just, it's like a little kernel and mm -hmm. like if you pop it, it's like everything inside that little kernel. It's like a moment. And then I just start, I, I use those big stickies that are post-it notes and you yeah. can use them. This is like, did you actually want me to talk this? I do, actually. I'm, I'm really interested. Okay. I bet there are some other people, aspiring writers or writers out there, who would be interested in, in your process. So please, keep talking. Okay. So, and, and I'm, when I tell you that this is all over my, like, for a year, any of my friends, my kids' friends who are over were like, what is happening? Like, it, it really has to be all over the walls for me. I have to be able to see it in a big space. It's like your Carrie and Homeland board. Yes, exactly. Yes, except I'm just trying to figure out my own life. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So then I start moving them around. And after a while, so for me, it has to have double, double meaning. So this is a moment that was huge in my life because it stood for this and this and this. But in memoir for me, I don't want to know how this is just about you. I want to know how this is about everyone. Okay, so if it's like a moment about hope, I don't know, it's a birth, I'm making stuff up or whatever, mm -hmm. it's just a birth. I need to know like, what did that mean to me in that moment? But how is this little thing, like some kind of kernel of life that then I can offer as a, like a, a gift to everyone? Like a universal truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, and it's so funny because like my, one of my best friends is Liz Gilbert. She would tell you something different. She'd say, please, God, don't try to help anyone with your writing. That's like the kiss <laughs> of death, okay? But I can't help it. That's what I want to do, okay? So, um, so then, Katie, like, what, what starts to happen, I could never just sit down and start. I would be so lost in my brain and lost in time and lost in. I have to see it all in front of me take shape. And then... If there's a theme like untamed, okay, so it was really important for me to show, like if you think of it like a, an, an inverted mountain, like to show how we slowly lose ourselves, like how we get indoctrinated one moment at a time as girls, right? So I needed, I needed something about religion. I need something about the beauty industry. I needed something about food. Like I knew I wanted there to be a falling and then – in the middle, I wanted, like, the keys to freedom for me. And then the second half of the book, I wanted to scale back up the mountain in exactly parallel to the way we felt. So you would never see or hopefully even get that from the book. I don't know if people are getting that from the book. I think, yeah. But it's like an actual graph or something, which sounds so crazy because I am not a math person. But it really is, like, it's all been graphed out for me. So that's so interesting. So you don't just kind of sit down and you really kind of plan it out and and take a and 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 expand upon one small thing. Yeah, I used to be a teacher. I, my my real heart is elementary school. I was a third grade teacher and a kindergarten teacher. Uh -huh. And kids, whenever you tell them to write, they will write what teachers call bedtime to bedtime stories. So it's like a hostage situation like they'll be like I woke up and then I ate my cereal and then I read it and it's just like a whole day yeah so, so we I used to sit them down and say okay pick one of these things and write big about something small and that's how I feel is the best memoir writing it's like when one moment which is like kernel you just like if it was important enough for you if that moment was important enough to be imprinted on your brain and so you remember it that doesn't happen for everything, right? Right. Then it's big enough to sit with for hours and just let it explode into the reason it imprinted on you. And if you can, if you can figure out why that moment imprinted on you, because it taught you this and this and this and this, because it revealed this and this and this and this, then that becomes an entire chapter that everybody says, oh, my God, that, I get that, right? Yeah. So, um, that's super helpful, actually. Get some big post-its. 
Okay, I'm gonna go buy some. I'm gonna go to CVS after this and buy some big post its. That's all where right, all now. the writers are who don't really want to be writing. We're yeah. buying supplies. To pretend like <laughs> exactly. We're starting to write. Anything, anything <laughs> to procrastinate. All right, so I want to ask. I want to ask some questions because everyone was so excited that we were doing this. Um, how? Oh, let's see. This okay. There's a bunch of them, so I'm just kind of. This book has really resonated with people. This is a, a, a viewer, reader, whatever. I think particularly right now, what message do you have to readers who might be feeling like they're not being productive enough during this time? Oh, this is this question is my jam. Okay. <laughs> I want I have not written a single word since quarantine. I've been in I have been in quarantine for very early. I was an early adopter. Yeah, of quarantine. me too. Mm -hmm. And I have not written a single word other than I've been doing my morning meetings. I've been trying to show up the best way I can. I think this is an excellent time to just completely let go of the idea that we are robots who, who earn our worthiness from constantly creating and putting out content. Right? I think that is just, if we cannot allow ourselves to not do that right now, we never, ever will. And I also think that, like, when I think about art, I only write a book every, I have only released a book every five years or so, right? And that is because I will never write a book, in, a new book, until I can be sure that a new woman wrote it, right? Mm -hmm. That's like the sacred contract that I have with my readers. I'll write a bunch of other crap. I'll write articles. I'll write whatever as the same person. But a book is like, this is... There's a becoming time, right? Right. You don't just make stuff out of nowhere. Like, in order for something that you make to feel fresh and new, you have to become fresh and new. And I feel strongly that this time is a becoming time for a whole lot of people. Like, we are feeling things that we do not usually let ourselves feel. We are in grief. We are in fear. This is, we're like in a cocoon right now, right? We're being obliterated. And torn apart and shattered. And one of the best things I think we can do is just surrender to it. Right? Because we will come out of the cocoon. We will produce again. We will become robots again. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> just right now, I think it's just an amazing time to just let ourselves be if and when we can. All right. That's an excellent answer. Other than telling myself I am enough, how do you get that into your bones and believe it? Um, I think it's just a daily thing. I don't, um, I mean, the argument that I just admitted to you guys that Abby and I had earlier was because I was freaking out about scarcity of everything. Scar food stuff is just off the charts for me right now. I think for a lot of people who struggle with food, um, right now, just things being out of control and all of our fears kind of manifest in food stuff with scarcity and and overeating and all of it um that stuff is coming up um i don't know does anyone walk around and it's like yes i am awesome i'm nailing life i feel enough all the time i don't know that they do i'm not sure the secret is to have that figured out i think maybe the secret, secret is to say i'm not enough and that's okay yeah, or like, yes, exactly. Like, maybe the secret that's is that how I we're feel. all human. Great. I feel like I'm not enough, and that's okay. <laughs> that will also be on your tombstone. That should be my name of my book, I Am Not Enough. <laughs> Please I was going to call it While I Still Remember, but I don't think that's good either. Okay, let me ask another question. Uh, I, as an empath, I have a really difficult time sleeping at night. Mm. Do you have a nighttime routine that helps you calm down? Mm. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, I turn, often people will ask me, you know, how do you not quit work or quit? And my, my general belief is that the way you don't quit in the long run is that you are completely committed to quitting every day. Like I quit every day even even on big work days this is like katie this is like a middle of the night interview for me this is like 
furious lateness. Like really? usually by five, done. I care the most amount, Katie, about the world in the morning. I care the most amount till about noon. Then I pretend to care until five. And then I don't care at all. I don't care. I don't care about anyone or anything. I eat my food. I sit on the couch. I watch the Netflix. I get into oh, bed Netflix, very early. Yeah. yeah. I get into bed very early. I have a fan. I have, <laughs> Abby will never. It's very sad for her. Okay. I have a fan that shoots into my head this way. Then I have another fan that shoots at me from the ceiling because I need the noise. But then I also wear wax earplugs. <laughs> So I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> um, so I have to turn myself off at night. Um, and I used to have all kinds of insomnia issues. And I um, am also an empath. But I have to tell you, I sleep really well now. I wake up at 5 every morning. Aren't you having weird dreams, though, Glennon? I have the weirdest, most intense, bizarre dreams. Yes, me too. And so are my kids. So is everybody. Yeah. Luckily, luckily for me, all of my children want to tell me their dreams every day, Katie. But they, they wanna... should do it after breakfast because my mom used to say, if you don't tell, if you don't wait till breakfast, your dreams will come true. So you shouldn't tell anyone until you eat breakfast. I don't want them to tell me at all. So I think I'm just <laughs> going to tell them that Katie Kirk told me that if they repeat them at all, they They'll will come continue true. having them. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here. Oh, um, oh, this is interesting because you kind of mentioned it. Given the increased triggers, what is helping you stay on top of your eating disorder recovery in this time? Are you having Are you having challenges with that, Glennon? Yeah. And um, I I think I actually was struck. It's I hate it. I hate. Like I'm sweating a little bit more now. Um, I feel embarrassed a little bit that I still struggle with this because I feel like I'm supposed to be this like feminist something or other that has these things figured out. Um, and I, ha I feel like I have sort of untamed myself from a lot of the messages about women, like that we're supposed to keep our ambitions small and our voices small and our emotions small and our dreams small. But I and our body that. small. That one I can't undo yet. I don't know. I... I feel like that message must have been just ground into my bones. And, and it is so infuriating to me, Katie, because I told, well, it gets a little bit worse at certain times. Um, and when things are out of control, it gets worse. I was preparing for a nationwide tour before um, this happened. And when I'm preparing to go out, out, out in big ways into the world, I get a little weird. That's what we call it in my family is when I'm getting a little weird. Uh huh. Um, so it does get better sometimes. And then when it gets worse, I forget that it's ever been better. And I think it's been this way for 40 straight years. And that's not entirely true. But I told Abby recently that I think that probably 50% of my thoughts throughout the day are about exercise, food, body. Yeah. Which is so infuriating to me right because i'm a smart powerful woman like when i think about the opportunity cost of that 50 percent, right like the art that could have been made the activism that could have been unleashed it's just that's the cost of the shit yeah the i you think know? someone someone just wrote 80s media and i do think i mean i'm 63 and i think that some of my contemporaries and i talk about how this was so kind of ingrained into us from a very young age. I remember my two older sisters being on, you know, drinking tab and being on a diet when I was just a little girl and thinking, I, I, I agree, it's such a waste of time and energy to be focused on this. But there was something about how it just seeped into our DNA and it is very hard to let go of that. And we were even saying, for our age, sometimes we have a hard time with the body positivity movement, embracing it as much as we know we should, because we're almost Pavlovian in the way mm -hmm. we've been conditioned. Anyway, it's interesting, isn't it? Wouldn't it just, I would just love to think about all of it less. 
I don't want to be positive about my body. Yeah. I don't want to be negative about my body. I just want to stop thinking about my body at all. You know what I mean? I just, yeah. I just want to be able to eat and move my body a little bit and then trust that it will do whatever it's supposed to do. But we still see such conflicting images, I think, uh, you know, in, in mass media. I participated in a documentary a number of years ago called Misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's very hard when you're just accosted by images of what a perfect woman should look like. You know, I think it's so great. I used to get so grossed out by the Victoria's Secret fashion show. And I'd be mm -hmm. like, am I only the only one who thinks this is really harmful and damaging to women, especially young women, as they're forming their, their kind of understanding of what beauty is? And I feel like, uh, you know, finally, we're starting to evolve and appreciate that that needs to that needs to go away. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and maybe the best we can do is just talk about it sometimes. Is just yeah, I think so too, and talk honestly it about out. it. Um, yeah. What else? So tell me anything else. Let's just see if we have. It's so fun to do these because um, it's nice to to see if anybody has any other questions. We get. Are there any ones that I missed that I? We got a ton. I just don't want to take too much of your time. Hold on. Oh, how has it been leading and working from home? Any of those, any ideas for those wanting balance? Yeah, I mean, I, balance is not, I, I don't, I've never related to that word, right? I don't, I don't know anybody who, I like passion, I like rest, I like but balance is, I've never, ever talked to anyone who was like, oh my God, I love that girl. She's so balanced. Like, I don't know <laughs> what that is, right? Um, I, I think, I think, it, you know, work from home, that's not exactly what we're doing right now. We're not homeschooling. Right. We're like trying to manage our terror and fear while also trying to manage our kids' terror and fear and all of the loss and, and trying to like throw some vocabulary words at them. Like school, I was a teacher, like school educating children is a whole profession that people go to college for and learn how to do. You cannot be expected. You know, it's like, okay, now we're going to home surgery. Like, no, you can't. <laughs> you, it, 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 we have to stop expecting people to be doing impossible things, right? I mean, I feel very passionate about lowering expectations right now. You know, just, Katie, I talked to one of my friends early on in this, and she said she was stressed because she had let her, her kid, one of my favorite little people, have extra TV time. As if we should have TV time, like TV time is for peace times. Like in a pandemic, TV time is all the time. All the hours is TV time. You just, you start strong and you finish the day strong and none of the kids don't remember the middle. So you just let them watch a quick seven hour show, right? That's what we're <laughs> doing here. We're just trying to grasp a little bit of peace, right? Because the more peace we have, the more peace they will have. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. So I just feel like we all just bring our high levels to low levels. And we just... I agree. And, you know, I, I think that I was saying to... I was talking to a friend of mine earlier, Glennon, and I think one positive thing is how, how, much, how much more appreciative we are going to be of teachers, of, of moms who decide they want to focus on their kids because... I think it's it's calmed down, but for a while there was some tension between stay-at-home moms or working moms who work inside the home and moms who have jobs outside the home. And I hope that we're we're going to all appreciate each other a little bit more. Ch daycare providers or child care providers, and how we have to really value, I think, professions that heretofore have been kind of undervalued and underappreciated. I could not agree more. <laughs> That's one good thing that has come. All the teachers are like, how do you like us now? Yeah, right? <laughs> I've always now? believed they were undervalued and underpaid. And I hope, I really, really hope that we're going to elevate and appreciate teachers even more than a lot of people already do. Some of us have, and of mm -hmm. course, you as a teacher fully recognize it. But 
I think, I hope it's, it's a much better understanding on a huge societal level how really important important they are. Hey, Glenn, and before we go, because I've taken so much of your time, but it's been so fun to talk to you. And now I know why everyone is in love with you, because you're so great. You have to tell Abby I said hi. I will. But, um, I will. I, this is a good, uh, oh, this, oh, this is a good question uh, about the book. So, since everyone is so in love with the book, what what do you think is the most important thing you want people to take away from Untamed? Mm. I mean, I just hope that I think that a lot of what has made us so exhausted as women is just this constant hamster wheel of improvement. Like we just think that if we, we they just there's this ridiculous expectations and ideals that are put out for us as women. We were discussing one of them earlier with, with um, the body stuff. Uh, well, also the mothering stuff and the teaching stuff and the work stuff, all of these ideals um, that we chase and chase. And I hope that when people read this book, they will feel an abandonment of all of that and a returning. I just, this book is the opposite of self-help, right? It's just, a call to um, to stop chasing and just to return to that self that, that, that never needed improvement, that was always good enough, right? That was always enough. That was always, you know, the self that we had, the person we were before the world told us who to be. You know, I didn't I... know that self existed until I fell in love with Abby. I mean, I knew it was kind of like wrestling in there, but I didn't know because... I had just always done the things I was supposed to do and loved the people I was supposed to love and followed the rules I was supposed to follow. So it took like something happening that was so out of what I had been conditioned to do to be like, oh my God, there's a whole self in there that has like feelings and ideas and desires and plans. Like I can abandon all of that and just live from here. So I think it's one of the most revolutionary and like countercultural things a woman can do just to return to herself and trust herself. I think we've been really, really tamed from a million different places to stop trusting ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's it. Like if, 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 a, if women could read this book and actually start trusting that self inside and looking inside instead of outside for approval and consensus and permission and all the things that we're trained to do. That would be a miracle to me. I think all so many women think have this this voice in their head that says, "If only I were blank, mm -hmm. right?" Mm -hmm. And yeah. and I think that all of us are, I think, ruled by that voice of of self improvement and doing better and doing more. And so I think what you're saying is, try to get that voice out of your head. Yeah, and one of the ways to get that voice out of your head is to ask yourself, who's benefiting from me suffering in that way? There's always someone benefiting. Like, the way you run an economy is, you know, women who feel less than buy more. Right. right? It's, that's all it is. Once you, and that's what a lot of the book is about, it's just figuring out, oh, I feel like I, I'm not sad and depressed because life is sad and depressing. It's because I need these new countertops and these jeans. And these right. Have, right? Like, right. that's been planted in us. That's not like a, a fault of ours. That's the way our economy runs, to plant that doubt inside of ourselves so we will keep chasing things. Once we get them, they don't make us happy because you can never get enough of what you never really needed. Right. I right? think it's so interesting. The beauty industry is, is, is based on making women feel less than and unbeautiful and buy, 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 so they can compensate for that feeling of inadequacy, which was planted in the first place by the yes. beauty industry. Yes, yes, they're like the mafia. Yeah. They come to our door and they're like, you have a problem. And we're like, we do? We didn't even know we had a problem. They're like, don't worry, we'll fix it. Give us your money. <laughs> well, I didn't even know I had a problem before you came. Now well, I'll spend my life giving you all my money. A lot of people have asked me to keep this conversation because I think uh, they they have found it wonderful and enlightening and, and fun because of you, Glennon. And we're going to keep this. And if people want to subscribe to my newsletter, Wake Up Call, we're going to put a link to it there. 
We'll also put it on my social media channels. I'm just so happy that um, I got a chance to meet you. I was a little intimidated because I've been reading so much about you and, um, and, and you've struck such a chord that I was, I was kind of nervous about it. So thank you for making me feel so at ease. And, uh, and I just love talking to you and I'm so happy for you and, Hang in there, Glenn and Doyle. Oh, sister, this is how I dreamed our first conversation would go. <laughs> this is how I always dreamed it would be. Well, I'm so, I'm sorry it took so long for it to happen, <laughs> but I'm really glad it did. And thank you to everybody who um, who joined us for our our, our talk. And um, and I feel very lucky that I got a chance to talk to you, Glennon. Me too. Thank you for sharing me with your be beautiful audience and for trusting me with them. Oh, of wonderful. Course. Love their comments. Okay, Thank me you too. Guys. Okay, bye, Glenn, and bye, bye everybody. Katie. Bye. bye.